Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the service this morning, those who, have, who are here with us physically, those who are joining us online, we welcome you. This is a time of worship and praise. This is a time whenever we can, we can come together as God's people and we can lift our voices in song, we can lift our voices as we pray together, we can listen to God's word proclaimed, and we can worship him. Let's stand together, please, as we sing Showers of Blessing. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops from the star falling. But for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops from the sun falling. But for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need, mercy drops from the sun falling. Showers we bleed. We're privileged as God's people to come together and to worship Him and to give praise and adoration to Him. And so that's why we're here today, is to worship Him. We want our hearts to be pointed toward Him. And we want to him to work in us and change us and make us into the people that he wants us to be. So let's give him praise today. we come together 
wanted to praise him today. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, love with Hosanna ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever. As we gather for a time of prayer, it's, it's always the great reminder that, uh, that we don't just itemize ideas, that prayer and, and God's instruction aren't separate. It's, it's, they flow together in, in worship and prayer. They, they flow together. And, and I love how even at the beginning of Proverbs, it's the reminder that we're supposed to seek the Lord. In Proverbs 1, it says, to know wisdom and instruction to understanding words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing and righteousness, justice, and equality, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase their learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance, to understand a proverb, a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction." So, so all of the things we do here are supposed to be flowing together as we don't try to be fools, but we, we try to be individuals who seek that wisdom, who seek that understanding from the Lord. One of the uh, prayer requests we actually got this weekend was one of our missionary uh, people that we've used, uh, we, we call him Gary here for in case it gets out to public, but he sent us word that one of the contacts that they have in one of our closed Muslim countries, one of them got beaten up as in, in the hospital, and he came with some prayer requests of it's a closed Muslim country, so since he's a Christian, death is allowed within that country, and so they're trying to evacuate his family and are running into barriers there, and they've lost the ability to have contact to know whether he's in a hospital and alive or whether he's already dead. So for us, we might not ever know the name, we might not ever know the exact country they're in, but we as the church can still be praying for those around the world who are impacted by the government they're under and really the persecution of willing to, to give their life so that the gospel continues to go forward. So please join me in prayer, not only for things here in the U.S., but for brothers and sisters throughout the world who are facing things that we are not. So let's pray. Dear God, we, we come before you, and again, as, as your people, we do desire to seek your wisdom and instruction, as, as even Proverbs runs up to it. It's so that we are becoming wiser individuals, so that we are becoming people who know you. Lord, do not allow us to be people who create our own God because our own God is so much easier to follow. Do not allow us to become people who pollute your word because we just don't want to obey it. Allow us to be people who have that, that fear of the Lord, that, that reverence, that ultimate respect so that we approach your word and we approach our prayer life and we approach our worship with an understanding that you are God and we are not. And and you shape us, we don't shape you. Our, our whims and our desires are not what shape the God of all eternity. Lord, allow us to, to be those people who, as we've just finished First John, who 
test the spirits because we know Satan loves to masquerade as an angel of light to try and make us think, well, I am going to do this because I've prayed about it. And sometimes Satan loves when we pray our own desires into, into wi our will. Lord, allow us to still humble ourselves. Allow us to be individuals who, who continually go back to your word to, to test the spirits, to, to, to take that, that temperature, the barometer of what's going on and what is changing. Lord, we, we never want to overlook the many blessings we have. So we want to thank you for the blessings you've given us and really lift up those throughout this world who do not have the same freedoms. Lord, we, we do not even know this man's name and we do not know, you might have already called him home, but, but we know that his wife and his kids are in this, this limbo in which they're trying to hop from safe house to safe house knowing that the government and the, the radicals within their community would, would love to see destruction would love to give them as the example of this is why you do not trust in this name of Jesus. There will be consequences. Lord, if, if the man is still alive, we pray that you, your will is done. This again is, is sometimes hard to pray from my earthly perspective of am I praying for healing? Am I praying that he is a witness to those around? Uh, are they going to heal him just so that they can execute him or... And Lord, that's where our hands are open to you as God. Allow us to realize that that's sometimes our best prayer. May you be real in this situation so that people recognize you as the eternal God. Do not allow us to chase our idols. Do not allow us to chase those false gods. But allow us to be a people who humble ourselves in front of you so that your glory goes to all the world. Allow us to be the people who proclaim Jesus throughout all generations. And we thank you, God, that you have called this church and these individuals to be a small part of that, that we get to be your hands and feet who bring the good news to those who desperately need it. And we ask those things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As Pastor was praying, I thought about the gentleman that he said was, was beaten and was in the hospital because of his faith. And how privileged we are in this nation that we don't experience things like that. In some nations, it's commonplace. But I thought, why do people... Why do people who are Christians and believers, why do they go to foreign lands? Why do they go into countries like that? Why do they take that risk with themselves and with their families? And there's only one answer. It's because of Jesus Christ. It's not for them to bring honor and glory to themselves. It's because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. He willingly died so that people could be saved from their sin and spend eternity with him. That's why we do what we do. We proclaim Jesus Christ, who he is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We proclaim the abundant life that he has given us not because of anything we did, but it's all because of what he did on the cross for us. Would you stand, please? <clears throat> See, on a hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. Jesus set me free. Look, at the wounds that gave me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. 
my sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Sing for the freedom he has won, even death is dead and done. His life has overcome. Speak, say the name above all names, over every broken place. He is risen from the grave. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. Sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. Now, on a throne of majesty, the Father's will complete, He reigns in victory. Sing hallelujah to the King, He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. What He's done, what He's done, what He's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven. My future is heaven, I praise God for what he's done, what he's done, what he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. I praise God for what he's done. Sing that one more time. I praise God for what he's done. It's because of what he's done that we have the abundant life. We have the ability to go through life, not, a, not without any kind of problems. We know the problems are going to come. But even in the midst of those problems, we can sing. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea,
you did for what you, you're doing continually in our lives. May you be uplifted and glorified now as we continue to worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church family. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we're really glad you're here. Now, if you're new or if you've been here a while and you're considering taking the next step towards membership here at GCC, then I have some classes you might be interested in. They're called Next Steps and they're the first steps in becoming part of the church family. What are Next Steps? Well, they're three one-day classes on Sundays that pop up once every month or so and they can be taken in any order. The first of these coming up is called Lunch at Grace. Now this is exactly what it sounds like, a lunch following the third service in Hope Hall, where you'll get the chance to meet with the ministry staff and others interested in joining the GCC family. The next Lunch at Grace is next Sunday on August 21st, and the deadline to sign up is this Wednesday. Next, there's Sharing Grace, which will be on August 28th. Sharing Grace will help you understand the culture of our church, our passion to walk in authentic Christian life, and our mission as we move forward as a church. And thirdly, there's Discovering Grace, which will be on September 11th. This is your chance to hear about the core beliefs, doctrines, and priorities of our church. So if you're wanting to pursue membership here at Grace, we really hope you'll sign up for one or all of these classes at gcchapel.org events. Now, if you're looking for a place to serve at Grace, this is the perfect time to get involved. There are several avenues to plug in your gifting, so whether it's in the children's ministry, Awana, or something else, be sure to talk to Ministry Head today as we put our teams together for this upcoming fall. And that is all I've got for you this morning. So now, let's dial in and turn our attention to examine God's Word together. Good morning. If you were here with us last week, we actually finished up 1 John, and, and now we have this week between sermon series, and, and I always like to take a pause and, and really push us back to some of those, some of those habits we should be in, and, and today it'll be a push back to that challenge for 2022, prayer. Like, are you actually finding time to spend with the Lord? And, and again, this is not saying prayer is the most important thing. If we went back to 2021, the challenge was, could you read the New Testament in a year? And, and since I'm sure all of you have stayed in the habit of being in God's Word, which is an important habit, you know, we moved on to say, all right, do we take prayer seriously? And, and prayer too often, it's like, well, I pray before a meal, or, 
or if someone gets hurt, I pray that they get better. And, and it's sometimes oversimplified to say, well, is that enough? Is that really what, what godly prayer, what I'm supposed to do with my prayer life? And, and a lot of times it's, we're supposed to have a friendship with the Lord, which is not always a one-way street. We're supposed to sometimes sit in his presence and, and, and listen to him and, and actually be still and know that he's God and interact with him. And, and so prayer is one of those things that we need to have as part of our life. And five minutes a day isn't that much, but, but it adds up. If we did five minutes a day, it'd mean over the 2022 you'd spend 30-some hours in prayer. Think of that. Like, that's not going to be the worst day you spend in your life, all right? 30-some hours of you and the Lord wrestling through things together. And we did a whole series at the beginning of the year going, listen, you aren't going to mess up prayer, you know? Like, as long as you're not praying for some other God to come in and overthrow God, you know? Like, words aren't going to be the thing that messes you up. And, and it's really just that relationship, the heart. Hopefully, you've been doing that. But again, sometimes you get to that point where you go, well, well what if I've been praying and I just hit that day where I'm like, well, what am I going to pray about today, you know? One of those things you can do is you can pray through Scripture, and so, this is again a reminder that you can pray through Scripture. And so what we're going to do today is pray through Psalm 95. Again, not so much to say, well, we did it, but more to show, do you, do you see how you can mirror what we're going to practice today? And if you're going, well, how do you pray through Scripture? It's, it's a pretty simple idea. You take a passage, for us it's going to be a whole chapter, but it could be a a section of a chapter. If we were ever to pray through Psalm 119, we're not going to spend one sermon praying through all of Psalm 119. We couldn't cover it. So a section of scripture or a chapter, and you try and pull out what are the themes throughout this chapter. And as you figure out what a theme is, you then pray that theme as it relates to your life. So whatever the theme that you see in a section of scripture, you then go, all right, this is worthy to pray over, and then you, make a, then you pray a prayer with that as the, the core idea. So we're going to practice that today using Psalm 95. So pretty simplistic goal. We're going to read the psalm. We're then going to go through section by section, pulling out what's a theme from this section. And the great thing about this is you don't have to get all the themes. You could even get a wrong theme and. As long as it's a biblical theme, you're still praying to the Lord, you know? It's, it's a practice, but we'll pull out the theme, and, and then we'll take chunks of the time, and we'll pray that theme. I'll start, and then I'm going to, at some point in this sermon, give you time to pray about the theme that we pull out later in the psalm. So, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to flip to Psalm 95 with us. So, as we flip to Psalm 95... Again, it doesn't matter whether you have the, the digital Bible, whether a physical Bible, but it's always great that you put your eyes on this. We're trying to teach the habit of you being in the scriptures, not just someone providing words for you. So this is Psalm 95. We'll read the whole thing, and then we'll start working our way back through in sections. Starting there in verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. In his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as at, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me, and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed the generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. 
So again, that's the psalm in its completion, and so we're going to take it by section by section or theme by theme. And again, all of this, as I always tell you, you might not agree with the way that I've broken down the psalm. Well, you can break it down in your own way. But for me, first theme, verses 1 and 2. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So we, we start with this idea that God is worthy of praise. And, and some of your uh, translations might not start with sing, but it might actually say, ring a cry to the Lord. That's actually the word's actual definition is ring a cry if we go back to the original language. So it's this idea that we're supposed to be willing to praise God and to, to almost like shout to him, to say, all right, like it's not always just a, a singing of Man, let's make sure we all do our four-part harmonies and keep everything in the right chords. And, but God sometimes is worthy of just, just flat-out praise. That it's all right to have ringing cries, or, or as I, Isaiah says in Isaiah 42 when it talks about singing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praises to the ends of the earth. Who, who would you go down to the sea and all that fills it and the coastlands and their inhabitants? And if we hop ahead when he says, and let them all shout from the top of the mountain. Sometimes the Lord is worthy of praise to, to shout to. If you want me to uh, start to date myself, and I know I'm not that old, but went to, a, went to overnight camp and we used to sing a song called Pass It On, which I have not heard in Gen... <laughs> all right, a couple of people know it. You know, it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around will warm up by its glowing. I had hoped that this, con this, this section would know it, but second and third service are going to just stare at me and be like, what are you talking about? But it was a camp song, and I went to a Brethren Mennonite camp. So, like, as conservative as they came, like, some, some of the counselors would wear their head coverings, and, you know, because that was their conviction, but... But the chorus of that song, I'll shout it from the mountaintops. And then the kid's favorite part of that is when you finish that line, you shout as loud as you can, hey, hey, because I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I, now, I have to pass it on. I need to pass it on. But it's that idea of like that's a great expression of what the psalmist is saying. I'll shout it from the mountaintops and in a loud voice, Hey, I need the world to know. So the psalmist here is saying, the Lord is worthy of praise. The Lord is worthy of us being sometimes loud and going, Lord, you deserve this. And so if that's our theme, if the Lord is worthy of our praise, if he's worthy of that, what we do in praying through a psalm is we go, all right, let's stop and pray about what that theme is. And so we're going to stop and pray about things that God is praiseworthy over. So again, do you see how there's, there's a countless list here? You could spend your five minutes just listing the things that God is praiseworthy over. This is not a, let's make sure we get everything included in our prayer. This is just, can we pray over some things that God is praiseworthy of? And so we're going to pause and we're going to just take a quick 60-second prayer into what's his praise. So I'll lead this one. So let's pray. God, we are grateful for the fact that you've given us your word, that you have given us your word that we can actually understand the character of God. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you that you are not a God who's trying to hide somewhere in in the heavens, but you are a God who has shown himself. Thank you, God, that we live in a country where we can stand on this platform and we can preach the gospel. And Lord, we know it's persecution might come, but we want to praise you that we are able to openly and boldly proclaim Jesus. Lord, I thank you that that does not just have to happen in the church building but that in the world around us, that we as individuals have the ability to tell our neighbors and our coworkers and our family about who Jesus Christ is. And we thank you for that freedom. 
Lord, I, I thank you even for the simple thing that no matter what society I live in, this world cannot take my salvation. I praise you that you have secured me, and it is not something that a government or a, or a subgroup or a radical or a cult or whatever could take away. It is something that I am yours, and I am filled with the Holy Spirit, and I praise you that the Spirit is in me. We ask those things in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, just took a theme, God's worthy of praise, and prayed a couple things that praised God. And so the, the next section, we continue here. So we have, uh, I have it three through five. For the Lord is great and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. And so here you have the reminder of, of God's greatness. That man, God is awesome. So not only is he worthy of praise, it starts to remind that man, God is an awesome God. Do you know how powerful he is? And again, if you put it into the perspective of the psalmist being part of Israel, probably in a land where he is surrounded by plenty of false gods and plenty of false prophets and plenty of other people groups worshiping other things, and he's reminded that, wait, you're the only God. Or as he says, you're the, you're the God above all gods. You're the greatest king. You're the creator of all things. You've created everything. You've created dry land, and you've created sea, and you've, it's, it's a reminder that, that God is great. And, and that's one of those things that we sometimes forget. And, and we don't even always have to put this into our own words. I love how this psalmist doesn't even use his own words, but just starts walking back through who God is. Man, out of your hands, the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains. Man, out of your hands, the sea was made and the dry land was formed. And he's just walking through all of the greatness that God is. All of the ability that God has. So, so sometimes it's not even us going, man, I better think of the perfect words to describe the greatness of God. Sometimes it's the pause for us to go, do you know all the things God has done? Not only has he created everything, he's given me an avenue to interact with him. And, and not just like the Old Testament avenue of maybe there's a temple and a priesthood, but the avenue of Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and man. He's given me this ability for, for me to have relationship with the creator of all things. He's given me a savior. He's forgiven my sins. He's, and you just keep listing God's greatness. So again, we can do this. Yes, God's worthy of praise, but, but we can also list God's greatness. And it, it doesn't have to be a, a huge list. We can just start with the things we know. So we're going to pray, and I'm going to even keep this one shorter to say, well, let's just keep some simple, straight-to-the-point ideas of how great God is. So let's just do a couple-sentence prayer about how great God is. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that when the world peddles idols, you're irreplaceable. And Lord, when the world tells us to chase trends and fads, you are unchangeable. Thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. So again, the prayers don't even always have to be long. It's just you pausing, recognizing what you should recognize from God, and then putting it into your own words. Again, all of this is the encouragement to go, you can do it. This is something you can do. And so we've seen that God is worthy of praise and We've seen that God is great, like he has a track record, he has a history, if you want to compare him to anybody else, like he wins. And so we continue in this psalm to go, well, what's, what's the next section? So I have 6 through 7a. It says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is God, and we are the people of his pasture, 
and the sheep of his hand. And so here we have a humility time in which we're, we're called to humble ourselves. This idea of calling us to humble ourselves where when you praise the Lord and you start listing his greatness, the psalmist's reaction should be our reaction. Man, you're so much bigger than me. Like it, it causes the psalmist to literally say, man, I need to bow down and worship and I need to get on my knees to recognize that you are God and I am not. It's a humility posture. This, this seems like a good train of thought. Man, worthy of praise, he's so great, which then makes me go, and I'm so not great. He's worthy of my praise, and so we start to, to humble ourselves. And so this, is, this, again, should be part of our prayer life. If the psalmist recognizes he's humbling ourselves, and we, in the, in the understanding theologically, go, yeah, it makes sense. Well, then we have to go, well, well, then then we need to humble ourselves. We need to recognize that, man, maybe we are not chasing the Lord in the way we're supposed to chase the Lord. Or maybe we've been struggling with a sin that we just can't get over. Or or maybe I've been trying to fit God into my box. Because sometimes in prayer, it's not, Lord, shape me. It's, God, I will shape you. Too often we pray saying, I'm going to shape God. God, if you would just act like this, it will make my life easier. And, and that's not the result of understanding how great he is. It's us being open-handed in our prayer going, all right, Lord, show me how I'm supposed to act. This goes back into our first John challenge too. You better test the spirits because... Satan would love to tell you how you should act and be very unbiblical. This is where you go, all right, like if God's word says it, I don't change God's word. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so as we humble ourselves, a simplistic way to humble ourselves would be confession. Whether we like it or not, that's where we start to recognize, God, I have not met the standard, and therefore, I need to confess where I have fallen short. And so, sometimes in prayer, it starts to get into that uncomfortable time, and so now it's your turn to all pray out loud and confess everything. All right, we, <laughs> I won't have you pray out loud, but this is, this is where it starts to become personal. I'm not going to do this next 60-second prayer. I want you and the Lord to wrestle, and again, since we're in such a large group, you can wrestle in your mind, in your internal words, but this is where every prayer should sound different because it's the confession of your sins or the humbling of yourself. And please understand, confession is not always the end result. Sometimes you have to seek forgiveness and restitution, but confession is the starting point to at least admit, man, I've screwed up here and I'm not living to God's standards. So how about we take just 60 seconds to internally confess what we need to confess to God to recognize that we are not him. And so we'll do 60 seconds and I'll just close it with a simple amen. So let's, let's pray. Amen. So again, three themes we've pulled out of the psalm, and we'll pick up at the 
end of verse 7 there, 7b, where it says, today, and we'll do 7 through 9, 7b through 9. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. And so you have the psalmist who has a warning here, but like all scriptures, sometimes if you go, I have no clue what he's talking about, you have to get context. So let's hop back real quick to Exodus 17. And I think I have this one on the screen, but Exodus 17 where this is the reference. So the psalmist is saying this as if everyone assumes we know what this is, but let's read the reference so that we're on the same page of the psalmist of Israel. Exodus 17, 1 through 7 will summarize it enough for us. It says, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandments of the Lord. And they camped at Rephidim, Rephidim. but there was no water for the people to drink. And therefore the, Lord, therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff for which you struck the Nile and go. And behold, I will stand before you on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So again, this was one of the times in the desert. And so you see how the, the psalmist who just assumes all of Israel knows this story. And he goes, they put me to the test and asked me for proof, though they had seen my work. The people had come out of the promised land. This is the generation that not only saw all of the plagues, but the miraculous passing through the Red Sea and all of the provision and the manna in the morning and in the evening and all. All of the things that showed the Lord was with the people. And then they get a little thirsty and go, why would you kill us in the desert, Moses? Why, like, where's this God? And, and again, their, their memories were so short and their desire to say, can I be in charge, God? Because I would have had oasis after oasis if I had planned this journey. If I had the itinerary, if... And then again, it's, it's their doubt where they're putting the Lord to the test and they're saying, I don't, I don't know if I can trust you. And, and the psalmist is going, don't, don't be like that. Make sure that when you humble yourself, that when you confess your sins, you're not the person who then tries to control God by saying, but God, you better. And he, and he points back to Israel. And, and it's a unique thing because this isn't, pointing back to Israel because this is the generation that goes on in numbers and you have the spies that are sent out and everyone goes, well, we don't believe the spies. We can't do this. It's one of those funny things where you're going, wait a minute, why didn't he just point to that? Like, I think there's purpose here. I think that he's talking about like, don't let sin have a root that it continues to alter your behavior for years to come. This is when the people started to go, well, is God big enough? And, and it's almost like the spies was a, a foregone conclusion because they couldn't trust God in the simple things. They couldn't trust God in the, is his character the same as it was when he provided the manna this morning? Nah, he's forgotten us. He's just going to kill us in the desert. Let's stone Moses and see if we can get back to Egypt. It's, it's a bunch of doubt. And so for us, we... We can't approach God in that manner. We, we can't be the people who just go, man, it's, it's just small sin. Just skip it. Man, it's, it's, it's just the way I am. It's just the, and we start making all of these excuses to say, but, but this is why I'm allowed to do this. I know God's word says that, but I'm the exception. That's, that's not acceptable. 
And so part of confession then is accountability. It's this idea of like there's a warning about your disobedience and the only way you overcome disobedience is you seek accountability for people to hold you to the, to the right source. That right source is God's word. So again, if, if you want another tough prayer that you pray for the theme is you go, all right, I'm supposed to pray for accountability, that I actually follow God's word and I don't just give it lip service or go through the motions or, or rewrite God's word because, man, wouldn't it be great to have water in the desert? God, you're not with us. Give me the reins. You don't get to do that. And again, the, the prayer of accountability is that you're held accountable in small groups where your sin is exposed and people help restore you so it doesn't get to large groups. Again, this was the baby step of sin. Man, if the people would have turned back and went, you're right, God, we're sorry, we shouldn't have doubted you. Maybe when the spies came back, they went, man, we're still doing this because God's been faithful throughout this trip. But the more you let the small root take its hold, the more when the big decision comes, an entire generation was missed. So for us, a prayer for accountability is a, is a proper prayer. So let's, let's take time and, and ask God for accountability. And, and again, I'll pray, but this is also such an individual prayer that you can be praying in your head going, all right, where is the accountability within my confession of sin that I need to help me through this? So let's pray for accountability. God, we do pray that we learn from the psalmist's example, that we allow our sin to be exposed and corrected in small groups so it doesn't have to go out to large groups, so that we correct that and and Lord, this is generational sin. May we be the generation that stands firm on God's word and doesn't just write it off. Hold us accountable to stand firm on your word and allow us to be a, a beacon of truth into a world that is redefining their absolutes every other day. Allow us to hold firm to who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. And then the last is, is really the, the consequences of those disobedience. It's, it's the result of if you don't listen, you, you get consequences. Uh, for 40 years, I loathed that generation and, and said, they are the people who go astray in their hearts and, and they have not known my ways and therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Again, we have hindsight because now that we know the story he's talking to, the people leaving Egypt, we know what he's talking about. We also know that he's right. This is the generation that continued to turn their back on the Lord, and they're the ones that wandered in the desert for 40 years, and by rest, he's not talking about they were all unsaved. By rest, he's going, they didn't get the promised land. They had to wander. Their, their life was full of pack up the tent again and keep walking. They didn't enter into the land flowing with milk and honey. And so for us, we have to recognize that in our confession, in our attempt at accountability, there's also the possibility of consequences. If we have no desire to follow the Lord or we want to rewrite parts of the Lord's story to say, nope, I know better. Or as the beginning of Proverbs says, if we are the fool who despises knowledge and instruction. If we go, nope, you can't tell me anything. Psalmist is warning there are consequences, and he's using Israel's example to tell the current generation that consequences will come, and you might not see it, and, and even as you wander in the desert, you might not realize, man, there could have been a better choice here. He's letting people know that going to happen. And so we, we have to not just seek accountability out of going through the motions, but because we want to be shaped by the Lord. And so again, we, we pray to say, how can the Lord shape us? How can we be shaped by God's word? The reason we're trying all of these habits of, 
all right, we're in God's word and we're in prayer and, and we're going to seek accountability is so that we look more and more like the Lord and less and less like our own description or our own preferences or our own sinful natures. We look like the Lord. Why? To use John's language again, so that we are light into darkness that needs to see the difference. And so for us, we'll close in prayer asking that we be light into darkness and not a people that needs to learn through the hard way of let's just get the consequences and see whether we can survive them. Let's pray for light in the dark. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for you loving us enough that you've said that you love us just like a father loves a son, that you're willing to discipline us so that our, our motives and our hearts are corrected. But allow us to be wise individuals who accept the accountability at an early stage so it's not ugly discipline. Lord, the psalmist points to something that all of Israel knows, the generation that wandered and died scattered in the desert, the generation that could have settled the promised land. Allow us to be a people that is not chasing some political entity here on earth, but is chasing the God of all of creation, and we hold ourselves accountable to that. Thank you, God, that you have given us your word that we can dig deeply into. Thank you, God, that you have given us your Holy Spirit that is our mediator. Thank you, God, that you have given us prayer that we can talk to you. And allow us to use all of those in combination with accountability and fellowship and worship so that we are light into a world that needs to see a difference. We ask all those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, hopefully that's something that you can duplicate. If you want a challenge this week, find a psalm and pray through it. Thank you, guys, and have a great week. See you next week.
Chick, chick.